morning, folks. My name's Ian, and it's really wonderful to welcome you to church this morning. I hope and trust that you've had a good week, um, and if not, well, at least it's behind us now. Um, and so we are looking forward to spending the next few moments together. We're going to get the chance to uh, sing uh, together, well, wherever we're at. Uh, we're going to get the chance to pray together too, and to open God's word and hear it read and explained to us. A little bit later on, we're going to be thinking about trust. And so to begin our service, I would like to read a few verses from the book of Proverbs. Uh, in the early chapters of Proverbs, we are reading things that King Solomon has written. And he's a, a wise king, has great wisdom, and he's speaking to his son or his children as they're heading out to adult life. And so the wisest man that's ever lived is talking to the people who he loves the most. And this is one of the things that he will say to them about how, uh, how important it is to live well. Proverbs chapter 3, and I'll read verses 1 to 6. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you'll win favour and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. Let's pray as we begin our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness and goodness to us in many ways. Thank you that we can meet together this way this morning. Father, we pray that you would be preparing our hearts even now for what you might be wanting to say to us, to encourage us with and bless us with and perhaps challenge us with too. Father, we, uh, we just want to still our hearts now as we begin our time together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Good morning everyone, hope you're all doing okay and have had a good week. My name's Tom Carling, a member at Carnforth Free Methodist Church. I'm currently sat in my van trying to record this video as um, I've been asked by Christy a few weeks ago now to put something together about how God has changed my life or is changing my life. So I've not found the time or made the time, so I've decided to do it while I'm at work. Um, in between a couple of call outs in a service station. So I hope you can bear with me and if you hear any noise, it's probably just the motorway traffic. So yeah, like I say, I'm a member at Carnforth Free Methodist. We've been coming to Carnforth now for over 10 years, ever since the family, um, our, my family moved up from Devon. Um, so yeah, we know a lot of people at Carnforth, but anyone who doesn't, know know me um my name is tom i'm 26 i am married to rachel carling we have two beautiful boys called mateo and leo mateo is two and leo is nearly six months uh, seven months old now um i feel like everyone will see a massive difference when when we can finally meet up especially in the boys um so yeah really looking forward to that but i just pray that you're all doing really well and keeping um, close to God through this weird, weird season of our lives. So yeah, um, I would always say that I knew God from um, as, as, as long as I can remember being a child. Um, my mum and dad um, always used to take us to church, Sunday schools, encourage us in anything really that was um, to do with God, which I really um, thank them for now looking back. Um, yeah, and um, I would say from around 15, that's when I started to make a serious commitment to God and take it for myself rather than just as my mum and dad's um, relationship with God. I really took it on myself to have a personal relationship. And I would say from that moment on, God has um, changed, but is I, I like the word changing more because it's, it's ongoing. Um, like in a lot of things in life, we're never the finished article and um, God's never finished with us, I believe. And I just like that that thought that God's always working um, for us and that he's always working, um, yeah, for those that love him. And I, I, and I just, I really look back at certain aspects and certain moments in life when God has really been close um, He's really been um, solid and whether that be um, through quite a big thing of saving my brother's life when he was um, in a tractor accident on the farm when he was younger to, I say the small thing, but it's a big thing of um, having the right job, getting into the right sort of um, workplace. And obviously now owning my own business, it will be three years and I just thank God for the way he's guided and and sort of directed me through that in the right way. Um, in the way that myself and Rachel met, um, those who that know us know the, know the story, but it was just a, a great way that God provided for, for me uh, at that time. Um, I had a lot of failed relationships. Um, mates will joke and say that I had a lot of girlfriends and you know, all that that comes with. But yeah, a lot of failed relationships I thought might work that didn't. But looking back now, married for four years, two beautiful children, amazing wife, I can really look back and say, God took hold of that, guided guided me through it, um, through the disappointment, shall we say, and really directed me um, to, to Rachel and and the life that we now live. Um, I would say that that is just a clear example of how God can just take take a life and just gently, without sometimes realizing, just have an impact and it's only when you look back that you can see his hand so I just um, want to to encourage you with that um, but I would just say for any any of you out there that say when I, when I was praying about this on the journey before I pulled in I, I really feel that this is maybe aimed at teenagers um, we talked about it a bit at Life Group the, a few weeks back about how the teenage years are so important and I would just encourage any teenagers that are sort of um in and are in whether to completely uh, give their life to God or whether to sort of go on, say, a worldly path of either, 
um, sort of pursuing a career. I'm not saying any of these things are bad in 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 the right in the right context and the right, but just I would really encourage you to to push on and and search for who God is and and who who He can be in your life and how He can just gradually change you. For me, it was it was nothing dramatic. It wasn't that I was on a path of uh, drugs or drink or anything like that and then I got turned around but it's just been a gradual um, molding I would say of my character through through the years and as I said at the beginning the continuous um, molding that God if you let him in will will work things um, for good and will um, ultimately make you more like him um, so I would encourage yeah teenagers that are um, sort of at that crossroads it's a really important time to to nail nail your colors to the mast and um, and go for it and that's not to say that there will be um, challenges or or heartbreak along the way but um, yeah one thing I have learned is to live with um, with an eternal view so this life sometimes feels like that is everything it, the media and everything just says this is it this life make the most of this life this is all you get but I firmly believe um, especially in the last few few months um, trying to get closer to God through devotions and through um, reading and taking time out I really f believe that we have to have an eternal view on our time here not to hold things too closely or dearly uh, but to think about about heaven it's uh, it's a hard concept, especially um, when we're young, when things are going well, to think of dying. It's not the the nicest thing to think about, but um, I would just encourage you to think eternally um, and to place all of your hopes, dreams and aspirations in, in, into God's hand because they're good hands to be in. Um, so I've probably gone on, i probably said things... Um, that were confusing as Rachel would say I'm very confusing when I start talking uh, but I hope that it's been uh, real and that some something that I've said could sit with you and encourage you to follow Jesus for the first time follow him for um, the hundredth time coming back to him or just to to go to a new level I just pray that um, in this time of Covid that we would look at um, where we are with God and yeah just just push on I just feel the words push on and uh, get close to God is is what I wanted to to say we're in a strange in between right now no one quite knows what the new normal is going to look like we are anxious about the future and we certainly have many questions about it. Interestingly enough, there are so many characters in the scriptures who found themselves in circumstances different, certainly very different than ours, but nevertheless, circumstances that in some ways were similar to ours. I call it waiting room type of circumstances. You know what it's like. Particularly, I'm thinking of airport lounges when I used to travel going back at home, going back and forth between the UK and Romania, but particularly the journey going back to Romania to see my family. And often that was really frustrating because you felt like you were having to just sit about for a few hours in these overheated airport lounges with overpriced items that they were kind of trying to get you to buy. And you were just, what it seemed to me, wasting time, precious time. And often it would take, you know, I'd lose two days, one at each end of my holidays, just in that waiting lounge, waiting room experience. And certainly there are even worse waiting room experience. You know what it's like when you are just in that situation where you're waiting for a diagnosis, you're waiting for a reply from somebody on a really important issue in life, something maybe to do with an interview and you want to know how you've done and you're in that in-between time, in that waiting room where anxiety, fears, questions can all bubble up. What do we do 
in those kind of times. I want us to journey with some of the Bible characters over the next few weeks in the month of August and look at some of their smart choices. And I want to call this series Waiting Room Choices. And every single Sunday, we're going to look at one particular smart choice that they've made in order to progress and spiritually thrive, even in the midst of a difficult season. So today, the smart choice is made by David, and it's a choice of trust, trusting God, having faith. So to give a little bit of context in the story of David, most of us are probably not very familiar with the whole backdrop canvas. You can find it if you read in 1 Samuel chapters 16 all the way through to 24, where we're going to camp this morning. And you're going to find a, 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 a whole history of David's progression. Let me sort of build a picture for you so that we can better understand what was happening there. It simply starts with a king that is appointed in Israel, not really God's plan. God wanted Israel to be ruled by a theocracy and they wanted a monarchy. They looked at the peoples around them. They saw what they had and became envious and they thought of themselves. We want a king as well. Reluctantly, through the prophet Samuel, God uh, uh, agrees with their plan and tries to say to them, look, I'm going to give you a taste of what you wanted and you will be very disappointed, but you'll have to go through with it. So Samuel, the prophet, is appointing Saul, a Benjamite, a, a, a mighty warrior, a, a, a strong man, yet uh, somehow at the very beginning, a very reluctant leader, which probably showed a lot of humility in the early days. But Saul's life takes a, a, a dive in, in terms of his attitude towards God and his leadership. He becomes disobedient to God. And as a result of it, God has a plan B. A new king would be in the waiting. And God is sending Samuel, the prophet. He was the one that always anointed and appointed the kings to go to a particular house. And while you have this episode in which the father of the house is bringing all the gifted sons that he has one by one they are somehow discarded and discredited as not being the one that will be the king and Samuel was probably very surprised that he ended up with a question saying is there anyone else because it seems like God keeps saying no not this one no not this one no not this one and then one who was out with the sheep is called and he comes in his name is David and as an unlikely outsider he is the one that is anointed by God via Samuel to be the next king, the king in waiting. So David enters from that moment into his waiting room experience. He had an anointing. He had a promise from God. He was given a, a future vision of what he was going to do and who he was going to be and how he was going to serve God's people. But certainly there was no appointment yet. There was a time of waiting in the waiting room. In the meantime, things are beginning to develop as well. So he begins to develop a relationship with Saul. Saul kept having this, this attacks. Um, hard to understand from the scripture exactly um, whether God allowed them or God provoked them. Certainly, you know, it seemed like there was some sort of a a, a demonic attack, a, a rage that was coming upon him. And they were looking for somebody who could, if you want, worship and play worship music to settle his spirit. And they identified upon recommendation that David was a, a great harp player and he was a great psalmist, as we know from the rest of the scriptures. So David was asked to come to the palace and to soothe the king's mood and the king's spirit when he was in those tormented times so therefore he in a weird kind of way is getting closer to his future residence but he's still so far away from being in the palace as the king so he's in the palace as a servant and I love David's humility he just serves whenever the opportunity is before him and then another significant opportunity comes when Goliath who was a Philistine warrior is taunting God's people. Philistines and Israelites were always clashing with each other and fighting with each other. And the Philistines had stronger uh, armies and more suited warriors, better equipped, and certainly no better warrior for the Philistines than Goliath. And again, as an outsider, 
David is coming on the scene, offended by how Goliath was insulting God. He steps up to fight him one on one. And whoever was going to win the fight, their army was on the winning side. And against all possible odds, and you would remember this story from your Sunday school days, David is defeating Goliath and an amazing victory ensues. And this would have been an amazing surprise for everybody there. And at that point, David's popularity is beginning to rise. People were chanting about him, boasting about the numbers of people that he had killed, as opposed to how many Saul had killed. And slowly, the insecurity and the pride in Saul's heart is beginning to stir up. And Saul is beginning to detest David. And in one of these uh, calming um, soothing worship moments where David was playing the harp in a, in a moment of rage and anger. He's trying to spare him and kill him and he has to flee. He has another attempt and this time, in the meantime, David becomes his son-in-law, Saul's son-in-law, and he becomes good friends with the king's son, with Jonathan. And in this time, he has another attempt and David's wife saves his life. So David gets on the run because the king is after him. And the king doesn't know the promise that God had made. He doesn't know that Samuel was anointed him, but the jealousy and an insecurity are causing him to pursue and try to kill David simply because the people liked David. And here is where we pick up the story while David is on the run in the desert at En Gedi. And he's basically in a, in a rough terrain and Saul is chasing him. Saul has just been engaged in, 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 in a situation of hostility with the Philistines and this time Saul is chasing after David and here is where we pick up the story in 1 Samuel 24. So that's the backdrop canvas of what is happening in the story. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Paul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. And David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's rope. Afterwards, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his rope. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With his words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. There is a smart choice, a smart choice in which David chooses to trust God. David chooses to lean on God's sovereignty instead of his own wisdom. The situation is a little bit hilarious. It's it, it certainly, <laughs> if you were to make a, a, a historical movie about it, it'd be quite laughable. You have an, an army of 3,000 chasing and looking after David. And David and his men were probably around 600, so outnumbered five to one. And they are hiding. And there is a pit stop. Uh, it's almost like stopping at the services. And Saul just gets into this cave that probably would have been a sheltering place for the sheep and the shepherds in that area where they would have been. So it would have been a fair size, but not too big. And... He goes to relieve himself. Of course, because of privacy, he goes on his own. So none of his soldiers, none of his bodyguards are going with him and he's on his own. But what he doesn't know is at the back of the cave, David and his men are hidden. So you'd imagine that that cave would go probably fairly deep down unless they were split in different parts. One thing is for sure, this time Saul is seriously outnumbered. And it's interesting the different points of view and the different perspectives that they have on the situation. His men see this as an opportunity. 
His men think this is a gift from God. This is a, this is a divine opportunity. And they egg on David. They, 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 they try to push him to exercise revenge because they see it as something that God has done by finally bringing the man that unjustly is pursuing him in a place of vulnerability where David could do what every good warrior could do, strike him dead and finish the job. And David could have easily just probably gone outside, you know, holding, sorry to be gruesome, but probably holding Saul's head and going to the other warriors and say, I won the battle. I'm the rightful king. I have been prophesied by the prophet Samuel. You can check with him. God has already prepared this place for me. It's just this king that was standing in the way. That was one way to go about it. And certainly David's men were all pro. Let's act on this. This is God at work. And they quote scripture to him. They egg him on. They almost put a prophetic word, if you want, on David's plate and say, this is it. This is what the Lord is saying. Take advantage. Kill him. Get rid of him. Get your own way. Do it yourself. That's the message that comes from all those around him. And I can imagine this would have been a difficult moment for David. I can imagine that in that and we don't know how long the whole episode lasted, but in that moment, many episodes were playing in his mind. Episodes of injustice, the, 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 the prophecy that was given by Samuel and the anointing moment against all odds. When David thought, wow, this is unbelievable. I'm so unlikely to be this. The moment when we defeated uh, the, the, the great Philistine giant, Goliath. And Saul at that moment could have said, you're a wonderful guy. I, I can make you king. I recognize there's something special about you. The moments when he was serving at the court and, and, and seemingly being threatened. All those days and nights that had been on the run, facing the rough terrain, facing hunger. And just an episode beforehand where because some of the priests had fed them, Saul came with his soldiers and massacred, massacred them. So unjust, so unfair, so brutal, so awful. So David's feelings welling up in that moment. If he, he would have been overtaken by those feelings, he would have been so justified to say, right, this is it. Let's just go and finish the job, get it done and kill Saul. But he didn't do that. And I'm asking the question, why doesn't he do that? When he would have been so troubled by all those questions where he would have been saying, Lord, why is this happening to me? Why am I why am I being treated like this? Why is this injustice? I've done nothing wrong. How does he react so unexpectedly in the midst of being treated unjustly? By not taking control and killing Saul. You know, he could have thought to himself. I don't know what the future holds. Both me and this man can end up dead. This is not a joke. And pushed by either pride or fear, he could have acted, but he doesn't. Why is that? Because everything with our human instinct would have said, just finish it. It's an opportunity. It's so amazing how often we can deceive ourselves. And we can read a situation from the point of view that we want to see it. And I've met situations, pastorally speaking, and it's particularly relevant in, 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 in situations where, you know, let's say somebody really wants to do something and it seems like God is not OK with it. Somebody marrying the wrong person, getting in the wrong relationship, somebody starting a wrong kind of business. Somebody just doing something that is immoral or questionable. And yet we have this capacity as human beings of self-deceit that not only we convince ourselves that this is the right thing, but often we can even make it and manipulate it in such a way as to say it's God's will. That's what the other uh, people in the cave were saying to David. It is God's will. Let's just go for it. Let's do it. This is your time. But David is very sharp and he's very switched on and he has a very different attitude. Here is a man with a kingdom mindset with a capital K. He doesn't think like the world. The world says, take it. It's yours. Take it. Kill him. 
take advantage of this situation. David thinks with a kingdom mentality. And there are two things that are really key in this. One is he realizes that God is still part of the picture. So he's not editing God out of the picture. He's not acting in a vacuum where God isn't involved. And everything that had happened to David isn't just as it would have been. David finding himself in a most brutal waiting room of his life out in the wilderness at En Gedi. God was still in control. Now, I'm not saying that God had done all the bad things that had happened to him. But God was still in control. And David knew that. And when he speaks to the men, he says this. The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against, for he is anointed by the Lord. Did you hear one word that kept coming up? The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. Or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. See, David is recognizing God's supremacy over his life and his sovereignty. The Lord is that title of God as king the almighty ruler. And David is recognizing God's authority in his life and over the events of his life. He knows there isn't a vacuum. He knows that God is still part of the picture. And he doesn't listen to the voices around him editing God out, but God is still central to his life. And that's why he's able to step back, back off, because he's saying, I have the Lord in my life. God is in control, God is sovereign, and God will ordain the right time, the right place, and the right way for me to see the fulfillment of that prophecy. Wow. That's a heart that surrendered to God. That's a heart that chooses to trust God, even in the waiting room. David is expressing that, and as a result of that, there's a connection and almost like a real splint off from this because he recognizes that the Lord is still in charge. He also recognizes that Saul, as far as he knew, was the Lord's anointed. This was somebody, a leader who God appointed. And whether he liked him, whether he didn't, whether he had that promise over his life, God was still the one who appointed him. And he had that unbelievable sense of trusting God that God would do what's right with the man he appointed. And that's an incredible sense of trusting God. And I love the fact that David chooses not to manipulate the situation by trying to bring God into the picture with God doing something that God wasn't doing. At times, I wonder whether this would have been a leadership test for David from God, just to see how he would react. Remember that the reason Saul had fallen from the, the position that he had in God's eyes was because he was impatient, he was fearful of people, so the peer pressure was getting to him, and he DIY'd worship. He chose to lead the sacrifices when that wasn't his job because he couldn't wait for Samuel. Well, I wonder if God was testing David and saying, I want to see what kind of a leader. Are, are you going to do the same thing? Are you going to rush things? Are you going to DIY? Are you going to do something that isn't right in order to get to the ultimate reality? Are you going to be succumbing to peer, peer pressure? Those all would have been things that perhaps God could have been testing David. We don't know. One thing is for sure. He really trusts God to protect him. And that was an answer to his fears. You know, me and you have them. We have so many fears. If we're in the waiting room, we are fearful. Let's not hide that reality. It, it is true. We are fearful. So how do we combat those fears? It's by choosing to trust God. Choosing to say he is still the Lord. The, the other challenge in the waiting room is to do with our ambitions or even the promises spoken over our lives. 
where again we could be tempted to DIY like Abraham and Sarah did when because the promise wasn't coming through of a son that would become the, the father of m many. They decided to DIY because they were afraid and because they couldn't see the prophecy coming through. But to both the fears and the ambitions that David had, he responded with trusting God, surrendering to God, making that choice to say he is Lord and he is sovereign. He knows what he's doing. Where does this come from? How can David be so different than me and you? Because I know that me and you, when we're in the waiting room, we get overwhelmed with fears. Maybe I'm just speaking about myself. We get overwhelmed with fears or we get a real sense of, oh God, why is this not coming through? Why are some of the things that you've spoken about not, not fulfilled in my life? How long, Lord? How can you make that choice to not be tempted to DIY and manipulate? The secret, you'll find it if you read all the Psalms that David has written. And it's coming back to the same thing that I keep talking to you about. It's about devotion. It's about intimacy with God. It wasn't because David was special that he was able to trust God. It wasn't that he was different than me and you. Yes, he was. He, he, I couldn't play the half. He could play the half. I could never write poetry like he does. I know nothing about shepherding sheep. And certainly, I don't think I could have defeated Goliath. So there you go. Yes, of course, he's different than us. But in other ways, he's human, just like me and you. Why could he make that good choice in a waiting room? The secret is devotion and intimacy with God. And if you read the Psalms, you can see the secret that he has this unbelievable relationship of intimacy with God where he is able to pour out his heart in sincerity. He's able to reaffirm to himself the truth of who God is constantly and celebrate that, rejoice in that, make that his foundation. That's what you and I need to do. If we want to create this bank of trust in our lives to invest seriously in that intimacy and devotion with God and be able, when we're in the waiting room, to make the right choice, the good choice of trusting God. And you and I could be in this situation right now in your context. You've had a promise from God and it's not come through and you feel like you're in the waiting room. And sometimes, let me say it, sometimes in God's waiting room, it gets worse before it gets better. Don't be discouraged and don't think that's weird. In scripture, there are so many situations where it seems like sometimes God's people are pushed right to the limit before the breakthrough happens. And sadly, some of them bail out right before the breakthrough is about to happen. And I just think we need to realize that sometimes that's part of the journey that we have in this life. So whether that's in your in, in, in relation to getting married and, and some of you are anxious because you're not married yet and you want to have a family and sometimes you just want to rush it so that it happens but on the way make the wrong choice can i just say to you don't don't diy don't rush it some of you are in a situation with regards to work or business where you're having to make some choices and it seemed like god has had made a promise and it's not come through and again, something that is a bit of a compromise, <laughs> something that is a little bit stepping off the narrow way and getting onto the wide way is coming your way. And you could be tempted to say, hey, God's not come through. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do this thing. OK, it's not ethical. It's not moral. It's not right. It's robbing me of time with my family. It's robbing me of time from serving God and serving other people. But it's bringing more money and it's bringing a status. Resist it. Choose to trust God. And sometimes it comes to ministry or it comes to serving in a church. And I've seen that with a lot of people. If they don't get their way, if they're not humble and patient and wait for God, they just end up going outside of the church and doing it on their own. Sometimes setting up parachurch stuff or going to some other church. And, and sometimes it's that sense of just not being willing to wait wisely for God's sovereignty to continue to bring things about in the right way. Don't 
rush things and don't DIY. Lean into God. Build that bank of trust through intimacy. It comes back to the same thing. Reading the scriptures, praying, being with God's people. That's the secret. There's nothing else I can offer. And there isn't anything else that anyone can offer. That's the secret. And God will continue to push us hard towards intimacy with him because that's how we are changed into Christ-likeness, into becoming more like Jesus. And that was the secret of David's life. So I'm encouraging you when it comes to intimacy, a couple of things. First of all, make sure that it is scheduled. When you think of intimacy, think of your relationships. And I'm understanding that there are people who are single, uh, but we all understand this concept. In, a, in, in, a, in the context of a marriage, you need to have scheduled times of intimacy and building that relationship. Sometimes people call it date night, but they certainly put something in the diary that they want to be with their husband and their wife. In the same way, you've got to be intentional in building intimacy with God. So have rhythms and patterns in your life that prioritize spending time with God through reading his word and listening to him and speaking to him in prayer. Make sure that there is that sense of having things scheduled. Please schedule. If we don't master our diaries, if we don't master our time, which is, I think, one of the most valuable talents from the parable of the talents that God has given us, we will never be able to thrive in terms of intimacy with God. That's a simple secret I'm going to tell you. You need to schedule it, to plan it, to, to do it on your own and do it together as a family. And the second thing, it needs to be spontaneous as well. Again, in a relationship, in a marriage, it's not like, oh, you know, I'm not going to buy you any flowers because it's not date day or it's not your birthday or it's not your anniversary. Or we're not going to go out for a meal tonight or I'm not going to speak words of kindness and build you up and encourage you and thank you and express gratitude because today is not date day or it's not Valentine's Day or it's not your birthday. No, 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 no. Of course, we have to have those scheduled times, but we also have to be spontaneous. And that's part of being in a relationship with Jesus all through the day. OK, we have our scheduled times, but all through the day we take a posture that is echoed by the words that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica. And those words at first reading seem crazy, where he says, pray continuously. What is Paul trying to say? You know, do we kneel down all through the day or do we just go and sit in the church and pray? No, he's saying have a posture and an attitude of heart where you're communicating with God all throughout the day. So that's what I mean. Read from scriptures when you get a break. Just read from scripture instead of checking social media uh, and getting yourself wound up uh, and wasting time watching another w weird YouTube tutorial or uh, scrolling through Insta. Just maybe open the scriptures and just read a couple of verses and pray through them. Thank God. Take a walk. Listen. Have a posture of listening in your break. So have both scheduled and spontaneous time to build that intimacy because that's how you build that bank of trust in knowing who God is and letting your heart be filled with a sense of encouragement. I love the way Johnny Erickson Tada, who has lived most of her life as a paraplegic, wonderful Christian, she talks about this. Real satisfaction comes not in understanding God's motives, but in understanding his character, in trusting in his promises and in leaning on him and resting in him as the sovereign who knows what he's doing and does all things well. That's my encouragement to us, to do that, to lean on him, to know him, to listen to him and to surrender to him. That's a good choice in the waiting room. Amen.
God of love and hope, you made our beautiful world and care for all of creation. But the world feels a really strange place right now. The news is full of stories about coronavirus and life is far from normal. We lift those before you who we know that are going through challenging times right now. Those who are poorly, those recovering from recent illness or have had new diagnosis. For those who have lost loved ones and are grieving. Those who feel lonely and isolated. For those who are gripped by an overwhelming sense of anxiety. Those who feel hopeless. Those who are struggling physically and for those who have long-term chronic pain. We pray for those who are choked with doubt, those who are struggling with money, for those who have issues at work, those who are struggling in their relationships, for those who are tired and weary. We pray for those whose faith is being shaken at this time and those who are living with unanswered questions. God, we cry out on their behalf and we ask that you will surround them with your love and your peace. We lay ourselves before you too, as only you truly know how we feel and what is going on with our lives. Be with us, Lord. Bring hope and light, and may we know your peace. Remind us of your goodness, Lord, that you are a refuge in times of trouble. Thank you that even in these anxious and unsettling times, you are with us. Thank you that you are the way, the truth and the life. Thank you that you are the light of the world. Lord, help us to put our trust in you. Help us to know that you are with us. And may we trust in your word and in your promises, even when things don't make sense. Some verses from Romans chapter 8. Who shall ever separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it is written and forever remains written, for your sake we are put to death all day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors and gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us so much that he died for us. For I am convinced and continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present and threatening nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the unlimited love of God, which is in Christ our Lord.
Lord God, you are always with us. You alone are our hope, our strength and our counsellor. You are our shield and our anchor in the storm. You know us completely and you love us completely. You are with us in the day and in the night, whether we are awake or we're asleep. You are with us when we are happy and when we are sad. You are with us when we are healthy and when we are ill. You are with us when we are peaceful and when we are worried. Help us to remember that you love us and are with us in everything. We thank you for the gift of prayer, that we can lift these people and situations to you, knowing that you hear our prayers and you answer. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your unfailing and never ending love. And we thank you that we can place everything in your hands, knowing Father that you are sovereign and no matter what, we can trust in you. Amen. This is my car. 
Just wanted to say a big thank you for being with us today. Uh, again, it's been a real joy to know that uh, quite a lot of you are watching. But those who are part of the church family here at CFM, but also those of you who are further afield. And it's been a pleasure to have you as our guests. As always, please feel free to get in touch with us. It'd be fantastic if we can be of any support to you, of any encouragement, whether that is praying, encouraging you in your Christian walk, uh, maybe even starting the journey and certainly it's just great to be able to know that uh, these services are making a difference in your life as well so we're always eager to hear some good news particularly for those of you who are not aware that you're watching this a couple of things uh, about the week to come um, tonight we're going to have a zoom meeting and uh, it we changed the plans a little bit, so our guest will be postponed for a little bit further on. 
simply because they have to, <laughs> being on the other side of the ocean, they're in a service at the same time that we're doing this on a Sunday night. Um, so it'd be um, just requiring some organization with regards to them being able to, to make it in one of our Sunday night Zooms. So what I thought we would do this Sunday is we would have an opportunity for all of you to come and share encouragement. How has God encouraged you in this season? Uh, whether there are any answered prayers, whether there are any fabulous stories of God's work in our lives. We want to hear them. We want to encourage one another by them. And we certainly want to celebrate them. And then after that, we're probably going to um, get ourselves into uh, some smaller rooms on Zoom and pray together, thanking God for those things. And as our faith is strengthened, actually praying for one another. So I'd love to do that as a sense of celebration of God's goodness on Sunday night, that's at 7.30 on Zoom. And then midweek, again, we're meeting on Wednesday this week. Um, and so midweek Zoom, I really want to encourage you to come. We're gonna have as our guests, the members of the building task group. And they want to share with us uh, uh, about the journey that we've been on and how God has been speaking to us over the years. Quite a lot of you are fairly new. And I'm sure you're not aware of the whole journey. And I think it's so important as we go forward to hear about that journey. But also I want you to hear what God has been speaking to us as leaders and why we feel this is such an important project. So really want to encourage you to come. It'd be an opportunity to hear that, but also an opportunity to uh, ask questions, uh, make suggestions, uh, have comments. So it's just wonderful to be able to do that. So that's going to be on Wednesday night again at 7.30 on Zoom. Details will be coming out to you early on Sunday afternoon. So really encourage you to connect with those couple of things. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and make much of Jesus.